Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. This is our February Central Florida Options Group meeting. And what I would say is, if you guys have any questions or comments, you can do a couple of things. You can just type it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and just ask the question. We have a pretty, you know, small group, so it should be, you know, hopefully you guys will have a lot of questions and feedback. Um, so I was doing some, while I was waiting for six o'clock to roll around, this group has been around for eight years now, which is pretty amazing um, and been a lot of fun. So we started with about six members. Kevin, you, you said five or six members that kind of, triggered that we had about six members when we started. We have over 700 right now. So that's pretty good. Um, and, you know, we had 24 new people join this year alone. So in, you know, a month and a, and a couple of weeks. So um, we're doing good. And, but, you know, one thing I would just encourage everybody, if you guys have topics that you want to hear or questions or just feedback to make the group even better, you know, please let me know. Uh, I'll At the end, I'll have my um, uh, email address so you can email me and give me your feedback and suggestions for topics. I'd really appreciate it. So, and just kind of as a risk disclaimer, you know, this is an educational meeting. It's not investment advice. So, um, you know, take what you learn from here do your own homework and then put it to work for you. So anyway, with that, I'll get started. So today we wanted to go over credit spreads. Now, here's our agenda. Just want to touch on the basics of credit spreads, um, why people trade credit spreads. I want to touch on trading credit spreads on futures, which is something I've started to do more of this year, I want to talk about neutral strategies and then also a strategy that I've been doing a lot of this year is on trading after earnings. So then we'll just do a wrap up and you know answer any questions. So, so that's our agenda for today. And again, if you guys have questions um, anywhere through here, just unmute yourself or type in the chat. Does that sound okay to everybody? Okay, so first thing, I'm going to put this over here. Um, so a <clears throat> credit spread is, is really, um, people call them credit spreads or debit spreads. So a credit spread is when you actually receive a credit for the trade. You assume the, the risk of the trade, but it's a way to generate income. And so you can either do a bullish or a bearish trade. So... Um, when I first started trading options, I always had a hard time try just trying to remember which was which. So I just put down a bearish is selling a call spread, a bullish is selling a put spread. So if you're new, this is a, a good slide to just have handy that, you know, tells you kind of the way you want to set it up depending on your thesis. So a bearish trade would be something... So I, I use Tesla. Again, it's not a recommendation. It's just uh, one that looked like a pretty good call spread. So on Tesla, it was trading at about 183. So selling a 200 call and buying a 205 call would be a bear call spread. So that's, and you would receive a credit for that, a, a dollar amount, and you'd have a risk if you were assigned a call. Um, a bullish trade would be selling a put spread. So I looked at BA, uh, Boeing, and Boeing was trading at about 209.73. So if you were going to had a bullish thesis, you said, you know, Boeing's been beat up enough, you would want to sell a put spread. You could sell a 195, which is, if you notice, it's below the 209. So you're selling the 195 and you're buying the 190. So in this case, as long as the price of Boeing stays above 195, you make a full profit at expiration. Same thing with Tesla. 
Tesla was trading at 183. If you sell the call, as long as it stays under 200, you make a profit at expiration. So that's kind of the difference between uh, a bear's trade and a bullish trade. And I didn't have this on the slide, but a neutral would be one of each, right? A, a call spread and a put spread on the same stock. Um, so when you receive uh, the credit, um, that's the most you can make on the trade. You can never make more than the initial credit. So if you sell a credit spread and you make a dollar, $100 per contract, that's the most you can ever get. Um, and uh, so Rob asks, are we going to just, just do basics only? I'm going to definitely show you some different stuff and show you my screen if you guys want to walk through that. Uh, and then, you know, this is a, a high level overview. So we're not going to go into everything about credit spreads, but I can tell you that high volatility or implied volatility is kind of a key to getting the most credit for your trades. So you want to, you know, be aware of how to look for volatility and, and, and use that to your advantage. So that's real high level. Um, so, um, just as a real high level example, if you sell a credit spread and you collect $1, um, $1 credit on a $5 wide, you would have $400 in risk, $100 in maximum profit. But if you, if this trade works because that they usually have a high probability of winning. So I wanted to talk a little bit about expectancy. So that's a really a key factor in, in trading credit spreads. You need to know kind of what your expectancy is to see if this is a viable strategy for you. So um, real high level, if in that example, you collected a dollar in credit, $400 in risk. And if you the standard kind of exit is 50% of the credit or two times the credit. So in that case, you would make a $500 or $50 win per contract, 50% of the credit or $100 loss if you exited at two times the credit. So if you won 80% of the time, you would take the $50 times 0.8. So that that would be $40. And then you would take your loss, $100 loss times 0.2, which is uh, $20. So if you take the 40 less the 20, the expectancy per trade would be $20. So that would be, if you looked at $20 divided by the 400 risk, that's a 5% return. So that's kind of a uh, real high level on expectancy. Um, some general rules, um, definitely you want to allocate into multiple sectors. Um, over the years, we've seen, you know, people that like, okay, tech is hot and I do all my trades in tech. And that's great when tech stays hot, but when it starts to um, reverse and move lower, then you're too susceptible to one particular um, sector. And the other thing is, you want to trade both bullish and bearish trades to some extent. So if the way I look at it, if the market is uber bullish, I want to be maybe 80% bullish, 20% bearish. If it's neutral, I'm trying to be, you know, 60 bullish, 40 bearish. Or if it's a really bearish market, I might be, you know, 60% bearish, 40% bullish. So I didn't, I never get too, too bullish bearish on trade on credit spreads, but I don't also don't want to be 100% bullish. So does that make sense, everybody? I know I rattled on a little bit there, but uh, the other thing is you want to make sure that you trade op liquid options and with an acceptable bid ask. So I always, at a minimum, in open interest, I want 100. And you want that bid ask to be somewhere, you know, 30 to 50 cents between the bid and the ask. Because what, what you'll find is 
um, what you'll find is if you take a trade that you know has really low open interest, you can get filled in that trade. But what will happen is you can't get out of the trade for whatever price it is. And if there's a big wide bid ask, then um, it's hard to get your price on the way out as well. So that's a key thing. You just want to make sure you're looking at the liquidity of the options and the bid ask spread. So um, someone had asked, you know, what delta do I use? I try to trade somewhere between the 20 and the 30 delta, just depending on open interest, whatever strategy I'm using. So that is, um, let's see. The other key thing is you want to avoid holding credit spreads through earnings or major events. And, you know, major events, I would take, you know, something like a, um, like a presidential election or something big, not just a, you know, CPI report or something. But if something like a CPI report was coming up and I was close to my target or whatever, I'd get out of the trade. So I like to kind of trim my, you know, open trades as a big event, but I always want to be out before earnings. Um, and then, you know, one of the things that you want to make sure you do is develop a plan and know what your profit targets are and exit levels. And so most people start with a 50% profit. And if the credit grows to two times, then they would exit the trade. Um, what I like to do in a lot of times is look at if I'm selling a put spread and I see a really clear support level. And if the stock breaks that support level, I will tend to exit the credit spread, even if I'm not at two times the loss. So um, same thing on a call spread. If you say, you know, the call is, um, you know, you have a two times the loss, but if it has a really strong resistance level and the stock moves above it, then it's probably a good time to reevaluate your position because if it broke through that support or resistance, then most likely it's going to keep going and you don't have to take a full two times the loss. Um, and then the last or last two points are, and this is a the, the that's a this is a big one. Um, if you let your losers run, um, you tend to you you might be right ninety percent of the time, but that one trade out of ten, you give back all of your profits. That's never a good feeling. So, point is, don't you know let your losers run. Use your, you know, exit levels and get out of the trade. And then the last thing that I would say is track your trades, kind of know why you got in them and why you got out and then use it as a, a way to learn from. Them. So any questions or any things that I didn't mention that you thought maybe the group might want to hear? Did I get them all? Okay. So, um, so the one thing that I would, um, let me see, there's one, okay, so the time period. So that's really, you know, a, a personal thing. I mean, most, I try to look out at about 45 days out on a credit spread. Um, sometimes I'll go less, but, um, but I, I generally like, you know, for somewhere from 30, to 60 days is probably my time frame. And I know, you know, other people go out further or shorter and, the, and I'll do some zero DTE trades, but primarily I go out about 45 days. And, uh, and yeah, I, I like to look at uh, the IV. Um, so I would say, um, um, you know, IV is, is really important. So if, I'm looking at, you know, say two or three potential trades and one has a 30 IV and then one has a 10 IV, I'm probably going to get better credit using trading that 30 IV. So, um, and then a really good follow-up is, well, what level of IV would you avoid? And I would say if it's above 
60, 70 percent IV is, um, you know, that is pretty um, high implied volatility. And what that means is that there's something going on with that stock. Either it has, um, either it has um, like an earnings event coming up. Or there's something going on, like a lot of times with a medical company, there might be an FDA ruling or the CEO is leaving or something like that. So if it's above 60, I'm starting to wonder like, well, what's going on here? And uh, and, and you probably, and unless you can figure out exactly what it is, you want to avoid that. So, um, and George had said, you know, 45 days at a 30 Delta is not that far out of the money. And that's true. So if you were very aggressive, that would be a setup. So again, I like, um, you know, 20 to 30. I'm generally in that 20 to 25 range. So um, so I, I want to be out of the, you know, sufficiently out of the money and above or below a support and resistance line. So, um, and Margarita S said, uh, uh, you like to trade after earnings are those debit spreads because the IV is low. So no, those are actually credit spreads as well. And and right after earnings, credit the IV is still pretty high. So I'll share a couple. I'll share an example of a trade I did this week um, on an after earnings trade. So stay put. Um, so let's see. So one of the things that I recommend anytime I talk to anybody about trading credit spreads is you want to make sure um, that you kind of set it up as a, a defined percentage of your trading account. So you might say, I want to trade credit spreads and I want to allocate, say, $25,000 to trading credit spreads. And then within that $25,000, you want to allocate um, you know, somewhere between 10 to 20% per trade. Never want to go much more than that. I always tell people, start with 10 and, and then go from there. And if you're new to credit spreads, start with one contract. There's no reason you know, to trade six contracts right off the bat. Just trade one until you really learn it. And so if you had 25,000 and you were you know, doing 10% per trade, then you would allocate twenty five hundred dollars per trade. So if it was a, you know, a hundred dollar um, credit, be about five or six contracts that you would trade. And to me, that keeps it simple that you're always doing the same amount per trade, and you're not trying to say, oh, this one's a thirty percent trade, this one's a five percent trade. I just like to keep it simple. So um, does that make sense, everybody? Any questions about that? So that's the way I do it. I mean, you certainly can do it, um, can change it around. It's your trade. But um, what I would say is if you put all your eggs in one basket and it doesn't work, then you're kind of, you know, you, you're at a, a loss that it takes a while to dig out of. So if you, you know, if you do, you know, like a 10%, you can turn that over and, you know, make, you know, 10, 20 trades in a month. Um, and reuse your capital. Um, so the other thing that I've started to do more of is trading uh, credit spreads on futures or cash indexes like SPX. So um, a couple of really cool features about the futures and cash indexes. One is... Um, that they have a much lower, particularly in the futures, a much lower buying power reduction. So if you're putting on a trade in um, the ES the, or the EMEA in micros, the buying power is much less than if you're doing a, you know, a five wide in uh, Apple or Microsoft, which is pretty, is pretty good in, in terms of using you know, your capital efficiently. Um, the other thing is that, and this isn't a bullet point, but you can't be assigned early. 
So even if you're in the money, you don't have to worry about being assigned. They, they stay open until expiration or whenever you close it. And then there's special tax treatment that on SPX and on the futures, re regardless of how long you've held the, um, the trade. So if you put, if you do a zero DTE, 60% of your gains are treated as long-term capital gains and 40% short-term. So that's pretty, pretty impressive if you're in a taxable account and you're trading in a short-term. Um, and then if you trade an SPX or even the futures, it really avoids um, overnight, you know, earnings events. So you don't have to worry about, you know, like, oh, does Microsoft have the earnings before my expiration date and things like that. It avoids the earnings uh, events. And you can put on and exit a futures option overnight. So if, you know, at eight o'clock at night, you look at your options in the futures and you want to get out, you can get out overnight. You don't have to wait until uh, 930 the next day. So, um, and then when we're done with the slides, if you guys are interested, we'll go to the option chain and I'll walk through the various things, if that's something you guys would be interested in. So if you are, just put in the chat that you want to see that and then I'll, I'll be happy to do that. So I love, I've, I'm starting to do a lot more on the futures and the SPX. So, um, so I think it's, it's a really cool, um, it's a really cool feature. So, um, yeah. So someone asked, George asked about the SPY. They have options every day and that's great. SPX has options every day. I think the Qs have them every day now. So, and I think I heard that the Russell was going to um, do them as well. So, um, so pretty, um, you know, if you like to trade a lot of different dates, it's getting more and more um, available for you. So that, and we'll go to the, um, some people wanted to see the option chains and stuff like that. So we'll do that after I get through the slides. Let's see. Um, so another thing I mentioned in the, um, the write-up for the meeting was selling a, buying a stock at a discount using um, puts. Um, so what you can do, and this was just a really quick example, you can sell a put, a naked put, or even a put spread if you wanted to, below the current price of a, of a stock. And what that does is it does two things. One, it, it enables you to generate income, and it also let you get the stock at a better price. And here's just a really quick example that I did um, today. So AMD is trading at about $168 a share. And so you could, if you wanted to buy the shares, you could pay $168 today and you're in the trade. Or you could put a, um, sell a, a 165 put that expires this Friday. So it expires in a few days, and that will pay you a dollar seventy in credit. So you'd get one hundred and seventy dollars for selling that one sixty five put. And if you were assigned the shares, you'd get the shares at one sixty five a share. And your basis would actually be one sixty three thirty which is 165 less the dollar 70. So you're getting even if you the price is still at 165, you're still getting it at a two and a half percent discount off of the 165. So and if the price stays above 165, you keep the 175 dollars or can roll it out or sell a new call. So um, I've heard people that have said, you know, I've been trying to buy this stock for weeks. And they bought and they sell puts every week and they just keep collecting money while they wait for the stock to drop. So just a really cool way of looking at a stock. If you said, you know, like, God, I like to get it, but I only want to get it at 165 or some level below where it's at, sell a put in it and 
you really win either way. You get the shares at a discounted price and keep the credit. So um, does that make sense, everybody? Okay, so a neutral strategy. Um, basic, most of the time, this is called an iron condor. And I'll be upfront. I don't do a lot of iron, uh, iron condors. I might do them as an adjustment, but starting off, um, I don't generally do this. But a lot of people like to do it, and it is a credit spread. So I did one on SPX, which is a, uh, a cash uh, settled option. And when, at the time I wrote this, it was about forty nine fifty four. So if you were neutral and you said, I don't, I think that um, the stock's going to stay between 5150 and 4760, you could sell an iron condor. So this is a $5 iron condor and it's pretty far out of the money. I think it was a, probably a 15 delta. So I went way out of the money and went out to March 15th, which is about 45 days. And you would get $110 credit per contract. And it's a $5 risk. So your maximum risk on the whole trade is $385. So that's a pretty good return. 110 divided by three, you know, 85 is, you know, over a 30% return. So, um, so that's why a lot of people like um, iron condors and, but you have to keep it a couple of things in mind is when you put on an iron condor like this, you now have risk on both sides of the trade. So if you said, you know, like, oh, I love the credit, but now the, you know, the market just keeps ripping higher, your call spread is going to be challenged. Or if it, if it reverses lower, your put spread is going to be a challenge. So um, that's what, holds me back from entering a lot of iron condors right off the bat. However, I will, I will leg into a trade. So if I start a call spread and the, and the stock, you know, keeps moving, I might add a put spread on to kind of mitigate my risk in the trade. So that's kind of how I use iron condors. I don't generally enter them. The only time that I would enter an iron condor right off the bat was if there was a really clear range, like the stock never gets above 100 and it never gets below 90. If it just stays in that range, then trading a credit uh, iron condor might make sense. So that's a, a neutral strategy. So any questions so far? Okay. So here's my after earnings trade. So this has been a something I've been working on a little, probably the last few months. So after earnings, it's not unusual to see a stock move either dramatically up or down um, after the earnings. And a lot of times it can be really overdone. Like a stock that jumps 14% after earnings, you have to go like, wow, I wonder if people who were up 14% are going to jump in and take profits. Or if you're down, you know, 14% or 10%, do people start saying, wow, I want to buy some of that stock when it's on sale. So that's kind of the, the, um, the mentality there. And as a stock comes into earnings, the implied volatility kind of peaks out right up to that earnings event. And then after the earnings event, that day, that IV or implied volatility starts to revert back to the mean. And if you put a credit spread on one way or the other, either bullish or bearish, the, the decreasing implied volatility helps your position. So, um, so that's kind of why, um, you know, you have two things, you have high implied volatility and the likelihood that the stock is going to, um, you know, pull back from its gain. It's it's very it's it's more rare that a stock will gap up, you know, 10, 15 percent and then keep going. A lot of times what it will do 
at least initially, is pull back. And I'll show you um, a trade that I did this week in Starbucks. So they had earnings on January 30th. And when it came out, it had a massive gap up, which that gets my attention. So I'm looking at the uh, at Starbucks, look at start running the, you know, the options. And so my thesis at the trade was as soon as this stock starts to pull back, then I'm selling a credit spread. And let me show you the chart. So hopefully you can see this thing. So you can see here that the stock gapped up and it kind of hit a peak and then it just collapsed. So what I ended up doing was selling a put spread just above this number, this level here. Um, I used March 15th options and I sold a 100, 105. I think that's what here's. Yeah. So on the same day or the morning of uh, the 31st, the day after they announced earnings, I sold a 100, 105 call spread, collected $117. And you can see, you know, what, what happened to the stock. It just ripped lower and was, you know, done in, uh, this is a 30 minute chart. So. Uh, so you can see it, it bottomed out and then it, it started, you know, starting to recover. But I was able to exit the trade by the end of the day for 43 cents. So I made a $74 profit per contract or a 19% return on risk. So, um, and the other thing that I, in terms of my strategy, if the stock had moved back, say it moved down one candle and then it moved higher, I would have exited the trade as soon as it, it crossed above that high for the day. So I wouldn't have stayed in for two times the credit simply because if it, if it moves higher, then I'm, then I'm wrong and I don't want to take a big loss. So, but in this case, you know, within an hour or so, it had already, you know, bottomed out. So that's why... I really like the after earnings trade. So um, you can look in the morning and see, you know, what trades have made massive moves. Almost always it's either an event um, like their CEO is leaving or, or a merger or things like that. But oftentimes it's an earnings event. So then your IV is going to be high and you can kind of make a trade based on uh, your thesis. Do you think it's going to keep going up or do you think it's going to fade? So that's the after earnings trade. And um, that was a great example. And they don't all work, but but they work, you know, pretty, pretty high amount of the time. So um, uh, let's see. Any questions about that trade or anything I've gone over so far? Has this been helpful? Okay, so wrap up in questions. So I, I think it's, you know, credit spreads are a really good um, strategy. Um, and uh, so, you know, hopefully you can kind of dig in and learn a little bit more about them. Again, I would say, you know, figure out, you know, what you want to allocate towards credit spreads and start with one. You know, if you start with, say, 10 contracts, that adds a lot of extra pressure on you. If you start with one and it doesn't work, it's no big deal. So um, it's very scalable. You know, I've seen people that do 200 contracts and people who do one. So it, it's any amount can be, can be traded, especially if you're doing like SPX and things like that, where high volume, they, you know, 10 contracts, 20 contract is not going to really move the market. Um, then I would say is, you know, develop a trading plan that you want to make sure that, you know, fits your style. Like if you say, um, I don't, I'm willing to take less money, but I want to win 90% of the time, then you do, then you want to trade, you know, probably 15 Delta versus a 30 Delta. And you want to develop rules that says, you know, like I'm, I'm going to get out if I can make 50% or even 30% or if my stop, 
you know, if it moves beyond a, a support level or a resistance level. And then you want to make sure that you're only trading liquid options. So, you know, if you if you never heard of the company before and it's a, you know, a $12 stock, it probably doesn't have good liquid options. So if you stick with ETFs and stocks, you know, um, you're not going to run into problems. Um, the other thing is you want to make sure that you're holding this. You're not holding a trade through earnings because those can, it's just a crapshoot. You know, you could have a terrible um, stock and it goes up after earnings or a really good stock and it tanks after earnings. So there's no rhyme or reason to it. So unless you just want to gamble, trading a credit spread through earnings isn't, doesn't put you know the odds in your favor. And then well, the other thing I would say is, you know, take your profits. You know, if you're up 50% and you can, you know, grab your profits or even 40% in a quick period of time, and then you can redeploy your capital for another trade. So think of it as like you're trying to churn your capital so you can make more trades and make more profits. Um, and then I put in all capitals to manage your risk. What I've seen, you know, over the years is people who hate credit spreads say, hey, I made $50 per trade and I made five trades in a row and then I lost $400 on another trade. And that's, you know, that's very preventable. If you just have really good rules, um, then you're going to get out of the trade before it, uh, it really impacts your bottom line. So that's a big one. I put it in capital. And um, so, um, so those are really high level, um, you know, tips or uh, suggestions. So, um, and um, so George had a great question. Thanks for asking this. You, when I say 15 Delta or 20, whatever, I'm talking about the short strike. I don't generally um, worry about the what the delta is for the long strike. I I like trading, you know, five dollar wide spreads. Occasionally, I'll do a ten dollar wide spread if the if the options you know don't have five dollars. And sometimes I'll do two and a half dollar wide spreads. But when I'm talking about the delta, I'm really talking about the short strike. So thanks for. Uh, asking that, George. That's a great question. So does that answer your, that clear that up for you? So here's my um, email address. So if you have questions about the presentation or um, suggestions of topics, you know, send me an email. I'd love to hear from you. And um, and if you want a copy of the slides, send me a note. I'll send you uh, the PowerPoint presentation. And I will post the recording on YouTube. So I'll send you that after it's, it's saved. So um, anyway, so that is my uh, slides. Um, and now I'm going to stop my sharing. And uh, so you have back to me. So let's go to... Um, an option chain, and then I'll walk through a few items with you guys. So, uh, uh, but before I do that, any questions um, so far that I didn't cover or you wish I had? Um, okay, so I'm going to go. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I did good stuff, Brian. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So, um, so let's go to an option chain. Okay. Can y'all see my option chain here? Are you, are you looking at the right stuff? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, perfect. Okay, so, so let's just do like SPX just as a, um, an example. So a couple of things is one is, and you guys probably all know this, but you know you can go down and you know like like George has said, you have options 
expiring every day of the week, which is kind of crazy, but um, gives you lots of choices. So if you were looking for a, a credit spread, one of the first things you want to do is figure out how far out do you want to go. And most of the time, I would start with um, like the monthly. So your choices would be either going to 36 days um, or let's see, uh, April is 71 days. So um, let's just, let's do 45 days just because it makes it easier. So I took a, a March 22nd, no, no magic to that. It's 45 days out of the money. So it expires in 45 days. Remember we talked about implied volatility. So implied volatility for SPX is 13.9. So pretty low volatility, but a lot of people love to trade SPX. And the expected move over this um, 45 days is 152 points. So what that means is that based on the actuarial um, you know, calculations, they say that SPX is going to go either up 150 points or down 150 points. So they're not saying it's going to go one way or the other. They're just saying that's the range. So um, if you were going to sell, say you were bullish on um, the overall market, SPX, you could go in here and your delta is right here. So if on the put side, which is on the right side, you would want to go somewhere in, you know, that 20 to 30 range. So let's just take a, um, like a 24 delta right here. And that would pay us $32 and 50 cents credit. Now our risk is $479,000 if we just left it alone. So if we said we wanted to do a 25 wide spread, so now our risk is $2,100. Or if we just wanted to do a five, our risk is $400. So in this particular trade, we would have, um, we'd be selling the 4825, which is more, um, almost 150 points out of the money. And we sell one, we buy the other. It generates $80 um, in credit per contract. And it um, the buying power is $420. So that is a very standard um, credit spread. So does anybody have any ticker that they wanna see as a potential credit spread? Oh, somebody typed. Oh. Um, the yeah. burning, can I say something? Sure. Yeah, it, it, it's a great, great program so far. Oh, thanks. Uh, you, you said it's $120 out of the money. Uh, that's only 3%. Right, right. Okay, and, and, uh, and, and over how many days are we out? Yeah, this one's 45 days. And again, yeah. I, I was just kind of picking it as an example, not. No, I, I, I understand, and, and, yeah. and so with, with a three three percent three percent move is a likely two week move. Yeah. If if the market is trending. Yeah. And and, and so you really have to be directional if you're going to. Yeah, what you're saying is you you don't anticipate the market dropping 3%. You, you, you're you bullish, right? So you think it's going to move higher. And so that would be why somebody would take a trade like this. You know, one of the things I've recently focused on in trading, in spread trading, is that this spread, no matter how many days out you have it, 30 days, 20 days, 10 days, when the Lower spread when the at the money when the strike gets to be at the money, that spread will be worth 50 50 percent of the spread. Mm -hmm. Okay, and 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 that's just if you, if you think about it. Okay, so if it, if it goes to the to the lower strike of your spread or the higher what it's put spread to the higher spread, that spread is if you're sold it for thirty cents, it's going to be two dollars and fifty cents. Gotcha. 
Gotcha. And when it gets to that price, no matter what time period it is, mm -hmm. because, yeah. because to the option trader, when it's at the strike, it's at the money, and it's a 50-50 chance of being higher or lower. Right, right. Okay, so, so when I set my targets, I'm viewing my target as a 3% move. Okay. We'll, 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 make it go, we'll make it go to 50. I do the $1 spreads. Okay. So that'll make the $1 spread go to 50 cents. Gotcha. Okay, so my risk is if I sell it at 25 cents, looking to take it off at 10 cents or something like that, mm -hmm. and my risk is going to be exiting at 50 cents right. when it gets at the money. Yep. Good idea. I mean, there's... And, and, but that's irrespective of time. Time yeah. doesn't matter. It's just getting to 50 cents because it'll be at yeah. the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, now you do, just, yeah, I mean, that's a great point. And, uh, so if somebody, uh, let's see, Jay asked if we would look at LI. So I'm guessing this one has a higher implied volatility. So let's just go out. Let's go out to March 15th, just, um, as an example. So, uh, a couple people coming in. So, so here is LI. It's a 30 $30.95. It was up $2.95 today. So um, they have earnings on February 26th. So that would be, um, you know, a big um, red flag for me. I would say I have to be out of this trade by February 26th. So if I don't think I'll be able to do that, I'd probably wait till after the 26th or this might be a great after earnings trade. So let's see when they have their earnings. It doesn't say if it's morning or night, but um, but if I was, you know, um, Jay, are you bullish or bearish in LI? So um, so so what I would say a bullish. Okay, great. So if you were going to do a trade and you said, you know, I want to sell the 2722. Um, so that is um, outside the, you know, pretty much outside the expected move. The problem with, with that particular trade is it doesn't, um, 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 it doesn't give you much return. So this one, you could almost do like a $2 widespread and collect $36 on a $160 risk. So that's probably something like I, if I was going to trade this particular stock, that's the way I would look at it. The other thing